Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for joining me here today as we look into another unsolved mystery. This is Candace. Candace has been seeking justice for her brother um, for many, many years at this point. When this video was posted in February of 2019, uh, you could hear the desperation in her voice. She's being very open about the fact that she's reaching out to different true crime organizations, different personalities, trying to get exposure raised to her brother's case, and she's just hitting a wall with it. Uh, thankfully, she has a good friend that has reached out to me uh, using the new submit a case form that I have. You can find that in the description box below if you have other cases you might want me to look into. But... This case is really one that uh, I feel like has a few very big gaps and some really big questions. And uh, to Candace's point, it's really only been covered by uh, local media. I haven't seen any things that I would consider major media or national level media. Thankfully, a podcaster did cover this, a uh, actually a podcasting team. And I'm really thankful when I bump into podcasters that do the type of work that these young ladies did. Uh, and I'm going to tell you more about them as we're going through the case. But thankfully, every now and then, you find someone that actually puts up a lot of very helpful information on top of their episode, actually cites their sources, includes information that you can't get anywhere else. Um, and that really helps for the web sleuthing community. It helps for other people that come along after the fact that are able to look at that look at that information, conduct our own searches on top of that to try to flesh out that information even more and maybe ask some new questions. And that's really a big part of today's episode as well. But to understand this case, we really have to roll it all the way back and start at the beginning. So starting at Wikipedia, where does this take place? Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville is the capital and most populous city of the U.S. state of Tennessee. Uh, it is the 24th most populous city in the United States. Now, uh, when it comes to the crime statistics, there's some pretty troubling things when it comes to the Nashville area. Um, basically, for their crime stats, they almost triple our national averages. So here we can see for murder and non-negligent manslaughter uh, for the year 2017, the national average was 5.3. And what that means is 5.3 murders occurred out of 100,000 people. For Nashville, we can see that it's triple that, 16.29. And the trend seems to continue through other areas as well. Um, but despite that, this is an area that has a pretty good thriving economy, a lot of different businesses. Of course, music is a huge industry there as well. Uh, education is really big as well. So it's it's interesting to me that we have such disparity. Um, there's There's got to be some range of socioeconomics that are going on in this area, especially for the type of crime statistics that we're seeing. So, um, but let's continue and learn a little bit more about today's case. We're going to start here at newspapers.com. This is from the Tennessean, and this was published April 14th, 1998. Smoldering body of man is found beneath highway. It was still smoldering when Michael Harvell called police, a body so badly burned that investigators could not immediately tell if it was a man or a woman, black or or white. From what Harvell could figure, the body hadn't been there long. It's one of the worst I've ever seen, said Murder Squad Detective Larry Flair, who said the body was likely doused with an accelerant, uh, set on fire, and left in the clearing sometime early yesterday morning. Neighbors said they heard a car leave around 5 a.m. Uh, Harvell called police about three hours later after his niece saw the charred smoking figure and realized it was a body. It was burnt beyond recognition. Uh, Metro Medical Examiner Dr. Bruce Levy said that the victim appeared to be a black man in his 20s, but by last night, the victim had not been identified. Initial autopsy results showed the man was probably dead before he was set on fire, but Levy was unable to determine a cause of death, ruling the case pending. Uh, another interesting point that I don't think shows up in this article is um, he was actually found rolled up in a carpet. 
uh, and that was burning as well. And I'm just kind of curious about that just as a piece of forensic evidence, you know, if there was any analysis done with the carpet trying to determine what type of make or manufacturer it was or possibly where it came from. And I don't know if we're talking about like an area rug that he was rolled into or if we're talking about a section of installed carpet where someone literally cut a square around him and rolled him up into it. So uh, a lot of questions when it comes to the details on this case. But it's a tough one because we're talking 1998, of course, and the internet just uh, isn't quite uh, hopping at that point compared to where we are now. Uh, so this is an address, 5, 7, uh, 1517 Mary Street in Nashville. It wasn't found here, but this is the closest address to where uh, he was actually found. And let's go ahead and drop down to the street view if we can. It was down at the end of the street. Um, pretty small street, only five homes on one side and a church on the other. Uh, we can see that is actually the church parking lot. There is the church right there. And if we spin around, we can see just a small cluster of homes kind of backed up against the highway here. And it was down off the end of this road where the body was found. So this is the area that we're talking about. Uh, according to some information that came out through the podcast, and I'm just going to get the name of the podcast out now, it's called Something's Not Right. Um, this area could be a spot where there might be some illegal activity going on. And because of the cover of the road noise right there, you might not actually hear what's going on. So people that might be using drugs might go to this area. Um, people that might be doing other illicit things might come to this area as well. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's bizarre to think of that happening so close to a church, of course, but... This is Mary Street. Uh, let's continue with another article over at newspapers.com. This one from July of 1998. So we have a little time that's passed. Crime Stoppers is now on the case. Uh, they're offering a $1,000 reward at this time. They're still looking for the identification for this slain man. Uh, sometime between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. on April 13th, a man wrapped in beige carpet and tied with rope. So there we have another forensic identifier, possibly uh, rope as well, uh, was set on fire and burned beyond recognition at the dead end of the 1500 block of Mary Street. Metro police know only that he was a black man, 18 to 25 years old, about five foot 11 and weighed 150 to 160 pounds. He was wearing a pullover shirt, blue jeans, a maroon CPO zipper type jacket, with YKK displayed on it and sandals. Now, I believe YKK is just a zipper manufacturer. I don't think that is uh, a mark that would really help you too strongly. And in terms of a Z uh, CPO zipper type jacket, I wasn't sure what that was. So uh, let's jump to a website real quick. This is in the 70s.com. And this is a picture of a CPO jacket. Uh, a little more information on it is in a comment below. It stands for Chief Petty Officer. It was patterned after a wool shirt that was part of the winter working blue uniform. The navy version is dark blue, almost purplish color, and it was often worn as a light jacket on board ship. Um, so that is kind of what it looks like, but I don't think it has a plaid pattern on it. The description that they're saying here is maroon. I'm seeing another description that describes it as red as well. So a little more detail, but we're really not getting anything conclusive in terms of helping them with identification. And that's why they're putting the word out here. Crime Stoppers uh, puts their number up. As a matter of fact, this Crime Stoppers number is still active. So if you have any tips about this case in the description box below, you're going to find uh, this Crime Stoppers number. I believe the $1,000 reward is probably still active as well. I think that's kind of the standard uh, reward for Crime Stoppers. So, um, but you can also call them and remain anonymous, which is a huge point, especially in a case like this. Now, thankfully, thanks to the podcasters, um, they released some information that Candace, I think, uh, there's another sister that's working with Candace. Uh, the two of them provided to the Not Right podcast. And one of those things is a police report about the body being found. This victim was found face up 
in prone position at the dead end of Mary Street in North Nashville. The closest address to the crime scene is 1517. At the time of this report, the body could not be identified due to being burnt beyond recognition. The body was transported to the FSC for further investigation. The case remains open as of April 13th, 1998 at 1500 hours. Um, so not a whole lot of additional detail there. You can see, I mean, it, it's really interesting to me to look at a form like this. Uh, I don't want to scroll it up because there's some personal identifying information for the people that called it in. But most of this form is just blank. I mean, there is there is really nothing they have to go on outside of they found this body. It was wrapped in carpet. There was a rope that was tying that. They've got a little bit of a description on the clothes, and that's about it. So I can't quite see the top of this. This is another document that was provided to the podcasters, I believe, from the sisters. Uh, it looks like it's from a website. I think it's Nashville.gov, and it looks like a posting about this case has just a little more detail than we've got from the, the news articles so far. Uh, same description about the date, same description about the place. Um, Metro Nashville police asking for your help identifying the victim, 71 inches in height, 150 to 160 pounds weight, pullover shirt and blue jeans. Also, a Tommy Hilfiger shirt was located next to the body. The victim was wearing a red CPO type of light jacket. So I'm very curious about this shirt. Uh, I, I suppose the first thing we should discuss is the possibility that the shirt might not be related to the case at all. Uh, you know, with the type of things that are happening apparently at that end of the street, uh, it could be that the shirt was left by something else. But for them to note it on here, I, I kind of think that they're suspecting that the shirt is related to this case. If he was found with his jacket on, I don't know that we could assume that that particular shirt was his. So could that shirt belong to someone that had done something to him, possibly. Uh, also, keep in mind, we're talking 150 to 160 pounds plus whatever the weight of the carpet is. Um, and I, like I said, I don't know if we're talking about just something like an area rug or a larger piece of carpet, but that could get pretty heavy fairly quickly. So I'm also wondering about the possibility that maybe there's more than one person that's actually moving him to that location. But could that Tommy Hilfiger shirt... Um, actually be related to one of the people that are committing this act instead of our victim. I think that might be a possibility. Now, I think in 1998, they probably weren't going to do the type of DNA testing that we have nowadays on a shirt like that. I don't know if this is still in evidence. I don't know how it's been preserved, um, but there is a possibility, especially with how technology has evolved, that that shirt might play a role in moving this case forward. Um, but let's jump over to another important consideration from Wikipedia, and that is what happens to this body. Well, it actually winds up in a potter's field. A potter's field is a graveyard where unknown or indigent people are buried. And essentially, they don't know who this guy is, so who's going to pick up the tab for his burial? Um, that's, that's essentially what happens here. Thankfully, Metro Social Services is there in cases like this. They have an indigent burial and cremation services branch that deals specifically with cases like this. They coordinate and fund the burial of deceased persons who did not leave sufficient resources to cover the cost of their burial expenses. Uh, that includes preparation and casket, transport, and a grave site in a cemetery. Um, and especially for a case like this where you're talking about an unsolved crime, uh, I think it is a pretty good move to make sure that there is actually a burial that happens with those remains because there is some potential that there might be forensic evidence that could still be collected from those remains as well. And of course, if there's a cremation, then you lose that opportunity. So I'm, I'm really thankful that they're operating in this way in particular for this case. And here is a picture of the headstone of the person that would become known as John Doe number 19. Now, while that part of the story seems to have hit its conclusion, there is another story going on that, of course, is directly related to this case, and that's the story of a young man who goes missing. His name is Lorian Nicholson, and thankfully, once again, thanks to the podcast and the sisters that are working on this case, uh, they've provided the missing persons report so we can go through the details here about what's noted on this report. So Lorian's mother... Uh, Mrs. Nolan stated that her son, victim, has been missing since Sunday. 
Johnny Nolan, victim's brother, stated he saw Mr. Nicholson Sunday and they lived together. He stated that his brother left the apartment on Sunday around 1,500 hours. No one has heard from him. Victim is known to smoke marijuana and he takes medication for schizophrenia. Mrs. Nolan stated that she does not know if he has been taking his medication and she is worried about his condition. I had the countywide dispatch check the hospitals and sheriff's department. He was not at any of those locations. Now, this next statement, I'm kind of struggling to make sense of. Uh, if you work in law enforcement and you have some ideas on this, please drop them in the comments below. But it says, I notified car 3126 of homicide and called in a bolo at 1309. Uh, the mother signed the report. Now, obviously, they don't know about... Um, the homicide that's directly related to this missing persons report. So I have to assume that he's talking about the fact that a homicide got called in at that point and he needed to notify a car to, to go check that out. And then effectively he concluded with uh, Mrs. Nolan and had her sign this. That's kind of the only thing that seems to make sense to me. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a date anywhere on this form. I see a block for the date and it's empty. Uh, there are other pages that are part of this as well. We're going to go over another one in a moment here. But um, once again, there's kind of identifiable information, so I don't want to show this uh, to you guys. But I can see a description of his clothing uh, for the, the missing person. And what's interesting is the clothing doesn't seem to match the clothing that we have from the body being found. Here it's saying that he was wearing a hat, a black Nike hat, no coat, a white shirt, blue jeans, I think that's the only thing that matches, and black Nike shoes, which uh, I believe that they thought from the articles that we saw that he was actually wearing sandals, uh, no, ju no jewelry. They do note here he was on medication specifically for schizophrenia, but they don't know his mental status at this time. Uh, they're saying he was not intoxicated, at least at the last time they saw him. So... Uh, some really interesting details here, and um, I'm, I'm already, the questions are already kind of hitting me, but this is a photo of Lorian uh, when he was younger, and this is a photo of him from his school picture. Um, thankfully, eventually, uh, the record for the body that was found gets entered in NamUs, and at that point, uh, I believe Candace actually learns about NamUs, starts going through the records there, finds this record about a body that was found on April 13th, 1998 on Mary Street, which is the neighborhood that they should be looking in. And she contacts law enforcement and says, hey, do you think that this is Lorian? Um, of course, it takes them a while to do DNA testing, but the DNA testing comes back and they finally do make the connection. Uh, they have found him and they learn that uh, he has been buried. So here is a collage of photos. Um, Dipti Vadia, hope I'm saying that right, um, took a lot of photos about this case. I believe he might have been working with the Tennessean at that point. Um, some of them are, are very, very touching, very emotional photos. Uh, we can see Lorian's mother um, very upset in many of these photos. And then there is an article that comes out at USA Today, uh, or actually, it, I believe it originally came out on the Tennessean, and now it's been kind of moved over to USA Today. And we're going to go through some details here, but know that um, know that Candace has some issues with this article, and we're, we're going to get to those as well. But this was posted in August of 2013. After 15-year search, mom finds son in pauper's grave. His gravestone simply read John Doe 19. He was the 19th unidentified man buried in the Bordeaux Cemetery. He lies in plot number 555, a grave overlooking the White's Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. Sylvia Nolan, a lifelong Nashville resident, just found out in March that her son laid just three miles away from her home in an anonymous grave. A police mistake in 1998 may have needlessly prolonged her pain. And of course, this is a huge question with this case. What happened with this case? We have a body being found on the 13th, and 
they're still talking, even though I don't have a date on the missing persons report, they're still talking about it within the same week because it states that, you know, Sunday. So we know within that week, they've got this missing persons report. And yeah, I did see some variation. I think the missing persons report said that he was actually six foot two, but that's kind of a minor variation. How did these things not get lined up? How did someone not say, hey, we've got this unidentified body. Let's go look at the missing persons reports. And by the way, let me know if any new ones come in over the next few days. How did that not happen? There might be an explanation. We're, we're going to get to that, but let's continue here. Um, he was a budding track star nicknamed Flagpole because of his skinny frame, who wowed coaches at Pearl Con High School with his speed. Um, not just coaches. If you do a newspaper search on him, uh, there's a few articles, the few articles that we've gone over already that are related to his case, but Ryan also has his own articles about him, about what an amazing track star he was, about the fact that um, he got to travel the country a little bit with his track team. Um, I mean, the kid could run a, a 430 mile. Uh, th this is this is someone that was very, very talented, but obviously we've got some big struggles going on here too. Um, he was a young man whose mental illness may have led him to the end of his short, tragic life. We know his name was Lorian Nicholson. His mother struggled with being a young single mother at the John Henry Hale Public Housing Project. Money was tight. It wasn't the safest place in town. As Lorian got older, he became a fierce protector of his little sister, Amira, and his stepsister, Candace Williams. He was quiet but sweet. He was a great runner, said Billy Fellman, a teacher and coach at Pearl Con High School in the 1990s. As a freshman, he won the city championship in the mile and half mile, top five in the district and region as a freshman. He was just a natural talent. And then one day during his sophomore year, he stopped going to school. He began to grapple with mental illness. In his late teens, he moved out of his mother's home and stayed with other relatives. And of course, according to those reports we read, seems like he was living with his brother at the time he goes missing. It was like he was confused as he was talking. It didn't make a lot of sense, jumping from one thing to another, not completing a thought, Williams, his sister, said. In what would have been his senior year, Lorian entered Job Corps. It was a voluntary boot camp-like training program in which he would earn his GED and get vocational training. But when he returned from it in late 97, his mental demons were worse. Nolan, his mother, tried to get him help, taking him to Vanderbilt, which is a, a psychiatric facility. He went on medication. He picked up smoking. His hair started to turn gray, even though he was only 18. Lorian continued bouncing from relative to relative until the spring of 1998. In April of that year, he left home and didn't come back. Nolan filed a missing persons report on April 12th, 1998. So there, this article is saying that they literally filed a report on the same day. I don't know if that's accurate because it seems kind of strange to me that they're saying Sunday in the narrative of the report. Um, when they could have just included the date or said today. So I'm not 100% on that. But like I said, it was definitely filed within the week that he went missing. So what about uh, the considerations here? What's going on with law enforcement? How do they miss the connection here? Is it reasonable that they missed putting these things together? There are two very big factors that I think we need to touch on here. The first factor is this tornado outbreak of April 15th through 16th, 1998, also known as the 1998 Nashville tornado outbreak. It was a two day tornado outbreak that affected portions of the Midwestern United States, Mississippi and Tennessee valleys on April 15th and April 16th, with the worst of the outbreak taking place on the second day. On that day, 13 tornadoes swept through Middle Tennessee, two of them touching down in Nashville, causing significant damage to the downtown and East Nashville areas. So that's certainly going to take a lot of focus and police resources at the time. And keep in mind, this is starting uh, just two days after the body is discovered. And quite honestly, we don't have I I'd still don't feel great about the time frame of when the missing persons report came in. So the missing persons report might have come in before this, might have come in after this, but regardless, 
I would understand why police resources are all of a sudden being pretty severely taxed in the middle of this. But then, you know, the tornadoes end and resources should resume to normal. And at that point, shouldn't someone have this on their desk and say, okay, it's time for me to go check those missing persons reports. Is there some reason why that missing persons report wasn't going to be considered? Yes, a huge reason. This is a supplemental report, also once again provided by the sisters to the podcast. On April 20th of 1998, a note was added, 1020 in the morning. Talked with Pauline. She stated the victim has returned home and is okay. Case closed by exception. Now, there is a last name for Pauline. Um, when I was getting this graphic ready, I blurred it out, but uh, effectively we're going to bump into it in an article later. I don't know who this Pauline is. Um, I don't know how she would have been able to do this, effectively tell the police, oh, you don't have to look for him. He's home and he's fine. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't have done a welfare check, especially looking at the original report that's stating, you know, this is a young man that has some mental issues, should be taking medication, uh, might be self-medicating with marijuana on top of that. You would think that it should be more than a phone call that just all of a sudden closes this case out. So... While I think we have a couple of important considerations for what seems like an easy linkage not being made, um, I feel like there's a very bad process here in terms of a missing persons case being closed out because you have someone that calls in. This isn't the mother that made the call. Uh, this isn't the brother, the two people that actually came in to report it. So who is Pauline and what I'm really curious about is why is she trying to obstruct justice in a homicide case? And we know at this point, his body's been found. They don't know that it's his body, but we know his body is found. This phone call is absolutely not just lying to the police, um, but impeding a homicide investigation and closing out a missing person investigation that shouldn't have been closed out. So this is a huge missing link to this case. Uh, and why is Pauline obstructing justice in this way? Does she know what really happened and she was trying to throw police off? I mean, that's the only thing that really makes sense. Or was it an, some type of mistake? She heard from someone that he was back and that he was at home and then she called it in. But why is she going to be the one to call it in at that point? There are so many things that are wrong with this part of the story. But ultimately what it does is it clears this case out. It, it closed it. So if someone does go, hey, show me active missing persons cases so I can see if I can match one up to this body that we found, this isn't going to be in the pile. So at that point, uh, is it a police mistake? I think at one level, having this case closed out by someone calling in or speaking to a police officer and saying, oh yeah, we know where he is. That is a procedural mistake. I don't know if it's illegal. I don't know if it's something that is even kind of against their rules for how they would process a case like this. Um, certainly seems like a learning experience because ultimately they're going to find out that, uh, no, he, he didn't return home and no, he is definitely not okay. And though the family had to wait a very long time, they do finally get to pay proper respects. Um, back to the article at USA Today, Danny Hubble figures he has dug more than 500 graves in his career. As a team leader for some of Metro Park's laborers, he began helping to bury Nashville's poorest when the city opened Bordeaux Cemetery in 1985. But this year, on May 30th, Hubble returned to Bordeaux Cemetery to do something he had never done. A gravestone needed switching, a gravestone he probably put there 15 years ago. So they had a little bit of a ceremony. You can see we've got some family members that are out there as they are switching out the gravestones. Um, here is a picture of the new one that's going into its place where we have Lorian's name. Uh, we have his actual year of birth as well. And that is a picture of Danny Hubble actually um, moving out the old gravestone there. And they said a prayer and had a little ceremony uh, as they switched it out. And there's a picture of Sylvia Nolan. So seeing some quotes from Sylvia um, and, and some footage, this seems to be a lot of resolve for her to kind of seemingly move forward from this. Um, and I'm not seeing any 
questions from her, at least in the media that, that I've seen. And I'm telling you guys, there's not a ton of media in this case, but I'm not seeing any questions from her about uh, what happened to my son. Like, how do we find justice now that we know that he was murdered and wrapped up in a rug and left burning at the end of a street? However, his sisters do keep asking that question and they reach out uh, through a Facebook group and that is how this connection is made to a podcast called Something's Not Right. And I know I've already sung their praises, uh, but I got to tell you guys, there's so many times when I'm looking into cases and especially with podcasts for some reason, no one posts their sources, um, helpful information to help other web sleuths that might be looking into this stuff. And it's pretty rare that I see a podcast like this one, Something's Not Right, where they have uh, incident report on the body, missing persons report that was filed. Of course, they have their episode, numerous photos that have been provided from the family. Uh, they include maps, photos of the area as well. Uh, and then, of course, actual sources. So I just got to say my hat is off to these two young ladies. And I know they're on a hiatus right now because of everything that's going on, but I really hope that they get back and get to work because cases need um, coverage like this. And, you know, admittedly, there's a lot of people that listen to these things and they're like, oh, I don't like the person's personality or whatever. Uh, I don't care. When people do work like this, they are the right people and they should be the more successful podcasts. So um, just once again, my hat's off to something's not right. So this episode drops in February 2019, right around the same time of that uh, YouTube video. Um, and I can see that there is a little bit of a swirl of attention that happens around this case because of this episode and people are sharing it. Um, and then things kind of go quiet again for about a year. And then in March of 2020, uh, just last month, all of a sudden, a new article kicks out, and here on Twitter, we can see uh, Emily Luxon, who is someone that actually worked on the new article, is tweeting about it, and you have Brian Haas, who wrote the old article, the, the one that we've been leaning on from USA Today. He adds a comment. Uh, this family needs justice. I profiled this case in 2013 here. He includes a link. So glad this case is getting some fresh attention. Now, we have... A, a somewhat emotional Candace here. Uh, yes, you did. She's replying to him. And you wrote the story as a heartbroken mother's search for her son, which was untrue. Your profile did not address why she told us he was in Kentucky and alive in a mental institution all those years. Why she never told us she filed a missing persons report. Um, these are huge questions. Um, and I don't even know how to address them in an episode with you guys like this, but I just wanted to put them out there. Candace, who has really been, from what I can see, the quarterback for engaging the media and trying to not only get the attention around this case, she's the one that actually put the connection together with NamUs. Uh, so she's obviously working on this case really hard to hear her be critical in that way. Um, it, it raises a lot of concern for me about what could be going on, what type of divide is going on in the family. Is this something that she heard when she was younger and misheard some detail, or is she spot on about this? And for some reason, her mother was telling a story. And maybe there's something even understandable in that. What if her mother was trying to lessen how everyone is worrying about Lorian? by making up this story about, no, we know where he is. He's, he's in a hospital. He's in another state. I don't know. This doesn't seem necessarily criminal to me because I, I do think there are reasons why a mother might kind of tell this sort of story to her family. But I got to tell you, lying to the police and closing out an active missing persons investigation, that seems criminal to me. And the only thing about that is I don't know if the statute of limitations is up on any charges that could happen around that. I would really feel like some type of obstruction of justice charge related to a homicide shouldn't necessarily have a statute of limitations, but I don't know for sure. And I'm positive it varies from state to state. 
Um, but let's continue here with some information that came out in this latest article that was released last month. Family Still Waiting for Answers 22 Years After Teen's Brutal Murder um, by Emily Luxon. I also wanted to call out, there's a really good video segment here as well. So if you do have the time, please come and check this out. 22 years after a Nashville teenager was brutally murdered, his family still doesn't know who killed him or why. Williams said she couldn't recall anything suspicious happening in the days leading up to his disappearance. That's Candace. I can't think of anyone who would want to hurt him. He was so loving and caring. A woman named Pauline Venable, who had no relationship to Nicholson, was quoted in the report as saying he had returned home and was okay. Williams said that was not the case. About a year later, his mother told family members that Nicholson was in a mental health facility in Kentucky. So it's so strange to me to see, um, you know, I mean, she had been trying, uh, Candace had been trying to get News Channel 5's attention for like a year. They finally get it. You know, they're interviewing her. You hit what I think is probably one of the most critical aspects of this story. And no one like just dives into it deeper from there. I mean, you, you have a name now, Pauline Venable. Um, you're talking to Candace about it. Does Candace know who Pauline is? So I did find a web sleuth thread on this case, and I believe that Candace might have started this thread. Uh, this poster, Lorian's Warrior, says that they are a sister of Lorian. It gives us a little more insight into who Pauline is. Pauline was an older disabled woman with whom my brother's mother lived with at some point before my brother died. She knew my brother, but I have no reason to think she would have made that call. I believe someone who knew of the murder called using her name so they would stop looking for him. Who would think police would not even do a welfare check? Um, pretty interesting. I believe Pauline has actually passed away, at least from what I'm seeing in the thread here. And uh, I, I didn't consider that that possibly someone knew Pauline's name and called the police saying that they were her. So um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to investigate that lead any farther. Um, Candace did seem to make some comments about, you know, there's a new investigator on it now. Seems like he's starting to make a little headway in terms of the investigation. Um, really, I'm, I'm really hopeful that some of those leads are going to continue to pan out. Every year around his birthday, I get the feeling I have to get this solved, said Williams. She has worked tirelessly collecting police reports and sharing her brother's story on podcasts and on social media. She continues to keep in touch with Metro Police detectives, but said updates on the case have been few and far between. I want the story to be out there in case there are people who may remember something, said Williams. I want to know why the missing person case was closed and the dots weren't connected. Candace is right on it. She knows exactly where she needs to be looking, and I think she's making a really good point. We need to raise exposure to this case. Uh, if you have friends that live in this area, uh, in Nashville, in Tennessee, I know I've got some friends out there. I'm going to ask them for some help on this too. Please share this video with them. Let's raise exposure to Lorian's case. Let's try to keep more eyes open, more hearts open to this, and help Candace. Um, find the answers that that she's looking for and help this whole family. I'm still, I don't want to be part of what I feel like there's a separation that's going on with this family. And, and I don't know if it's because there's something really nefarious that is happening within the family or if it's just some people trying to take care of others in a way that they're not comfortable with. I, I don't know what the truth is there. But I do know raising exposure to this case can only help it. And someone certainly knows out there what's going on with this case. And if you're that person, please find it in your heart to pick up the phone. Use that information down below. You can remain anonymous. It's it's this family needs it. A spokesperson for Metro Police said the case is still open. In 2013, detectives traveled to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to follow up on a lead that ultimately went cold. In 2019, one of Nicholson's relatives presented detectives with new theories on what may have happened. I don't know if this is stuff that Candace can share if she comes on the channel as well, but certainly something I'd like to talk to her about. So ultimately, Lorian does get a tombstone but we still have a family that hasn't found justice. I know that a big point that was brought up on the podcast in particular was about his hair turning gray. 
Um, and I was kind of wondering if there might be something else to that. So I did just a little bit of searching on it. Uh, hair goes gray when color producing cells stop producing pigment. Um, contrary to popular belief, stress has not been shown to cause gray hair. That's kind of what I was thinking too when I first heard it. I'm like, well, he's dropping out of school. He's trying to get his GED. I don't know if that went all that great. Now he's dealing with all these mental health issues. Could it be caused by stress? But according to WebMD, that's certainly not part of it. Scientists don't know exactly why some people go gray early, but genes play a large role. Also, a vitamin B12 deficiency or problems with your pituitary or thyroid gland can cause premature graying that's reversible if the problem is corrected. Thyroid gland kind of stuck out to me. Um, so I did just a little further research on that and did find this article, thyroid dysfunction can be mistaken for mental illness. Um, I don't know. I'm just wondering if there might be something here. Maybe that was another indicator of what was actually going on with his physiology that was leading people to believe that he had a mental illness, or maybe that was another side effect of his thyroid not working properly. Uh, I don't want to go down this, this lane too far, but I was just trying to make some sense out of the gray hair thing and kind of bring a bit of a new perspective into that. Uh, on top of that, Candace is wondering about this picture. This is a picture of Lorian with a woman that they don't know. And she's just asking on Instagram, does anyone recognize the girl in this picture with my brother, Lorian? So I just wanted to share this with you guys in case someone out there does. And maybe you have a piece of this puzzle. I found another video segment from the Tennessee and you guys might want to check out. It is on Vimeo. I'll have a link to that down below as well. Um, no real big major details there except one additional note, which was that when he was last seen, he was last seen somewhere on Jefferson Street. And you can see that's a street here um, that is not too far from Mary Street. If you're going right between Jefferson Street and Mary Street or towards the end of Mary Street, that's not even a third of a mile. Now, I don't know where on Jefferson Street he was seen, and this is a street that obviously goes extremely far, but it's just kind of interesting to me that uh, it's not too far off that where his body's actually left. So I don't know if that's possibly, was he living with his brother off of Jefferson Street or was he hanging out with friends at Jefferson Street? I don't know where that final sighting information is actually coming from. That's referred to in the Vimeo, but just another consideration with this case. And like I've been saying, keep in mind, Nashville Crime Stoppers, I think that's probably the best place um, that you can contact put in your information, especially if you need to stay anonymous. If you don't need to stay anonymous, I think you can also contact Metro Nashville Police Department. Um, I see that they're having different areas and I'm not exactly sure which area services this particular case. I don't wanna give you guys bad information. So if you don't know which correct Metro office to contact, I think your best bet is to put it in through Crime Stoppers. They'll certainly get it to the right place. Candace, keep it up. Keep up the work. You're doing a great job. I know it's frustrating. I know you feel alone sometimes. You're not. There's a lot of people out here that care. We want to see you find the answers that you're looking for. I know you're looking in the right place. And I know that raising exposure is something that is going to help you with that. So I hope that you appreciate what we've done here today. Before I end today's episode, I have to let everyone know about something special that a sponsor of mine, well, at least a previous sponsor, uh, is putting together. They are Magellan TV. You might remember them. We did some special episodes at the start of the year with them. Uh, they want to pay you $1,000 to watch 24 hours of true crime documentaries. If you think you could do that, get through full 24 hours and you want a thousand bucks for it, uh, I can tell you they have excellent content. They've got a very specific playlist. If you want to get more of those details, there's a link in the description box below to KUTV. Uh, I'll have that down there. Also, I'm hearing that you can get uh, 30 days of Magellan for free. You get a, a free trial month. If you use another link down there, try.magellantv.com forward slash lordenarts. It's still working. Get your free month, especially now. We're all looking for things to do at home. They've got a ton of different documentaries that you can um, dive into, including plenty of true crime content. So I uh, hope you'll check them out. Uh, before I end today's video, a big thank you to several patrons who are increasing their pledges, starting with Rebecca. Thank you so much. Lauren Booth, 
and Christy Lee. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit www.lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, or buy merchandise. All of it helps keep me here doing what I love doing, helping these families and spending time with you. Speaking of spending time with you, tomorrow night, Saturday, is True Crime Game Time. That's right. The live show here on the Lord and Arts channel where you get to hang out with some of your favorite true crime hosts and watch us play Jackbox party games. Uh, it starts at 8 p.m. Central. That is 6 p.m. Pacific Mountain and 9 p.m. Eastern. And you guys can get to play along. So get your cell phones good and charged up. Pull us up on the screen, grab your cell phone, and you will get to join in on the fun with us. Hope you'll check that out. Take care, everyone. I'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked on the Lord and Arts channel.